profit for you. So. <laughs> The world production of salt is about uh, 250, perhaps a bit more, uh, million tons per year. And uh, it is uh, interesting to note that approximately one third of each is being produced as solar salt, rock salt and brines. But uh, about a half, or more than half, about 60% of the total production is actually being used in the chemical industry. And that is mainly in the costichlorine and soda ash industry. Um, when we take a look at the salt quality, and uh, I think that is really uh, what I would like to talk about today, uh, then we can see that uh, salt is extremely versatile uh, as far as the quality is concerned. Usually the rock salt starts somewhere at 90%, but we also know salts that have only about 40-50% of sodium chloride. And then it goes further down and it goes to a vacuum refined salt, which usually contains something like uh, 1000 or uh, less, 500, 300 ppm of impurities. And what I would like to talk about today is the ultra-pure salt that would have less than 100 ppm of impurities. Uh, the um, quality of the salt, of course, is connected with the price. Uh, whereas low quality salt will be available at around $10 a ton, the further to the 100% purity mark we are coming, the price of the salt is going up. And it is not only the vacuum salt that can reach uh, prices around 60, 70 or even more dollars per ton, it is also a high quality solar salt that uh, can nowadays reach $25, $30 per tonne. In uh, 1996, uh, when I gave my first presentation on salt purity and on salt purification processes in uh, Chicago, we spoke about these types of impurities. It was calcium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, magnesium chloride, and that was it. That was the quality. Now we have this list of, um, of uh, membrane technology relevant impurities that we are looking at when we are testing salt, when we are evaluating salt uh, quality and uh, salt uh, processing options for membrane cells. So uh, let's take a look at it in a little bit more detail. Now, this is a comparison of two licensors who are requiring for their membrane cells a certain type of ultra-pure salt, highly purified salt for the cells as an input. Now we can see that the calcium magnesium is about the same. Uh, sulfate, uh, the one says it must be five gram per liter, the other one is a little bit more flexible. Uh, but this has to be seen in connection with the barium solubility. Iodine, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 ppm. Barium, uh, depending on the flexibility, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. Strontium, there, is, uh, uh, apparently, so, there are some, uh, apparently some different opinions. Uh, then aluminium, silica, uh, iron, and so on and so on. Uh, mercury, of course, is important in the conversion projects. The total, uh, sorry, 
the total um, organic uh, uh, carbon that we have heard about today uh, is being limited to 10 uh, ppm. Now, uh, I will go through this only very quickly because most of you are conversant with the uh, basic chloralkali equations and with the soda ash basic uh, equation with uh, the importance of the of the brine purity uh, in, uh, in in general terms the membrane damage is one of the most important ones hydrogen evolution in um, in uh, uh, in, in mercury cells, there are still uh, about uh, 30 or 40 percent of, of caustic and chlorine worldwide is being produced in mercury cells. In soda ash, it's the incrustations, the calcium sulfate uh, precipitation in the reactors. The problem is also with contaminated effluents and uh, bromine in chlorine, we have heard about that today already. Now, the basic brine purification uh, equations is the calcium precipitation uh, with, uh, with soda ash, magnesium precipitation uh, with caustic. Nowadays, uh, very few brine purification processes are operating with lime and soda. Uh, for, the, uh, for the precipitation, of course, uh, excess dosage is required which is also an important uh, uh, part of the cost. And um, brine purification as far as the sulfate removal is concerned, the classical methods with barium carbonate or barium chloride, with calcium uh, chloride, that's a bit uh, difficult method, requires long residence times. And in the past few years, the nanofiltration uh, has uh, become rather popular. Now, for the nanofiltration, uh, it is perhaps interesting to see how it works. We are so starting somewhere around uh, 80, uh, 90 degrees centigrade for the depleted brine. And uh, we are having a sodium sulfate concentration in percentage terms of about half a percent. Now, the solubility of sodium, of sodium sulfate at this temperature is only about 4%, 4 percent, 4 percent and perhaps a little bit more. But um, the nanofiltration wants to operate at about, uh, at about uh, seven, uh, 6 to 7 uh, percent of sodium sulfate, uh, about 80, uh, 80 gram per liter, perhaps even 90 gram per liter. Now, for that, to achieve that, because this curve is the solubility of sodium sulfate, to achieve that, the brine needs to be cooled down, and then, of course, again, heat it and uh, blend it with the circulating brine. Now, when we started looking at the um, economy of uh, brine purification, we have done that in connection with salt purification. And the idea, of course, was that um, we should be rather preventing than curing. We should be preventing, on one hand, the content of impurities that go with the salt into the brine, and in the past several years, we have uh, stepped backwards and started looking what to do, how to prevent the inclusion of impurities inside the salt crystals. And I think that this is a very important point uh, to bear in mind. You can remove from the... Well, salt is needed for membrane cells as solids, not as brine. Liquids and gases are quite easy to purify or to do something with them, but solids are not. You can only remove something that is on the surface of the salt crystals, and what is inside is locked. So it is important to understand how do the impurities get inside the salt crystals. 
Now, when we started, uh, as I said, when we started looking into the economy of this prevention approach rather than correction approach, uh, we started talking to people, asking them about their cost of salt, their cost of brine purification chemicals, and so on and so on. And these have been the companies with whom we were in contact. Uh, the various studies, of course, prices have changed throughout the years, but the various studies have shown that the cost of brine treatment can be extremely different. The lowest prices or lowest costs are somewhere around 1.5, perhaps 2 US dollars per ton of salt. The maximum up to 30, 20 times more. And if we take a look at the cost of salt, brine treatment and disposal together, we can see that it can reach, that it can vary from 10 to 50. Now, 50 dollars per ton for salt is a hell of a lot of uh, money uh, when, you think <coughs> when, when you think that salt is a cheap commodity. Now, when we take a look at it as a cost of brine treatment, as a percentage of salt cost, and as a percentage of the chloralkali production cost, then you see that uh, the Brine treatment as a percentage of salt can be 100%, but up to 300%. That means the purification is much more expensive than the salt itself. And that the percentage of the chloralkali production cost can be as low as 3, but can be as high as 40%. And very frequently we uh, hear that electric electricity cost is the main uh, cost factor. It is not necessarily so, it can be uh, sold as well. Now, in this approach of avoiding rather than curing, we have, um, uh, we have taken a look what can be done with the salt after it has been produced and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and prepared for the use in the membrane cells, that means centrifuge to get the moisture down to two or three percent. And uh, how, to, uh, how, to, how, to, how to put things together in such a way that the outside impurities, the impurities on the surface of the salt crystals can get removed. And this was the, uh, uh, this was the approach. Normally, you put salt and brine in a centrifuge and you wash the salt with water on the centrifuge basket. Now, we said the filtrate from the centrifuge always contains some fines. Okay? We can dissolve the fines and use this very pure salt in countercurrent flow to replace the impure brine in the vessel, in the decanter that is above the centrifuge. And then, uh, of course, uh, you have to get this uh, salt somehow to this hydroextractor, we call it. So this can be done by uh, hydraulic uh, transport. And then we can use the uh, first vessel, the slurrying vessel, as an elutriator. That means to have the brine flowing upwards against the salt and take the insoluble, fine insoluble impurities out of the salt and set, send it to a settling pond and reuse the brine. So these are the, these are the unit operations in the process. We call the process uh, uh, hydrosol process. The, the elutriation is based on differential speed of falling large crystals against small crystals. And because the gypsum is uh, also small, particularly when it is gypsum in uh, solar salt, it also falls slowly. When we reverse the flow, we can still have the large crystals falling down, but we remove the fine impurities upwards. Hydroclassification is something similar, but it is carried out in fluidized bed. And uh, the hydroextraction is actually 
uh, a countercurrent uh, removal of impure brine with, sorry, with pure brine. This is the pure brine created from the filtrate of the centrifuge, picking up soluble impurities, concentrating them, and getting them to the overflow. Now, it sounds very simple, but it only works if we achieve a plug flow. And this is what happens in a vessel that does not have a plug flow. Uh, this is a rut hole where the salt falls through the middle of the vessel to the outlet and on the side the salt is not moving. What uh, we have invented and, and tried out uh, is a true countercurrent flow. This is a model of such hydro extractor where we are having salt flowing down and we are injecting black colored brine into certain points and we can see that this brine is being actually pushed with the countercurrent uh, brine <coughs> upwards. <coughs> we have um, uh, several applications for uh, this process. This is one uh, that combines solution mining, uh, natural gas um, compression and sorry, uh, compression and storage, uh, brine purification. Um, Co-generation, natural gas uh, production, uh, production of electricity with natural gas, crystallization, of course, uh, of course, harvesting of the salt, and then purification of the salt. In this plant, the performance test has shown that uh, the calcium content can be below 1 ppm magnesium also, and the sulfate content in the average of about test performance, test runs, was 53 ppm. Uh, recently, we have been involved in a project where the use of very pure salt has been uh, contemplated, and we have taken a look at what are the qualities of vacuum salts that are available in Europe on the market. And we have tested them, we have seen what is, we have, we have tested them in the sense that we wanted to see what impurities are inside and outside of the salt crystals. And here you have one example. Uh, sulfate is the, is the most, sorry, is the most prominent one, uh, 100 and, 118 ppm. Uh, but out of that, three quarters are still on the outside of the crystals. Bromine is uh, um, not much different. Bromine co-crystallizes with the sodium chloride, cannot be washed out. And uh, this is true also about, about potassium. Another salt uh, with about 200 ppm of sulfate we can see that actually around 85% uh, of that sulfate still can be removed. The situation with the bromine is similar. There we have to go to the crystallization process and see what can be done there to avoid the co-crystallization. But there are also vacuum salts that contain almost 1000 ppm of sulfate and the sulfate is also, to a large extent, locked in the salt crystals and therefore it cannot be removed. Here, obviously, something is wrong with the crystallization. Now, in this, uh, in this uh, study that we have carried out, we have taken a look at not only at the, at the brine purification cost, but at all other costs in the plant that uh, are somehow connected with the quality of the salt. So it is not only the purification, it's also the salt storage and handling, salt dissolution, brine purification, as mentioned before. 
contaminated sludge handling and disposal, purge decontamination disposal, ferrocyanide, silica, bromine, iodine removal. We have seen in one of the uh, presentations before that uh, removal of impurities from the brine can add plant and equipment and gain cost and cost and cost. Power consumption is important, hydrochloric acid consumption is important uh, in connection with the falling um, uh, uh, efficiency uh, of the membrane. Membrane life, we have plants in Europe where the membranes have been in operation for eight years with still high, around, uh, around 96 uh, current efficiency and production loss or extra production capacity with falling, uh, with falling um, current efficiency. Now the example that uh, I would like to show you has been done on a plant capacity of uh, about uh, 300,000 tons per year of chlorine and it's a conversion uh, plant. That means the client has his primary brine purification uh, plant. And these are the elements that we have taken a look at. And we have seen that there would be two possibilities for this client to uh, take the salt from. The one salt would be a washed salt with these parameters, and the other one would be an ultra-pure salt with these parameters. Of course, this salt would not require several of uh, the units, uh, operation units that with the washed salt would be required. And we have gone through uh, the cost figures. We have seen that the salt cost, we have, adjust, sorry, we have adjusted the salt cost. Yeah. We have adjusted the salt cost here in such a way that finally both salts and, and operation cost with both salts would be the same. Uh, it is interesting to note that indeed the cost of brine purification chemicals is one of the most important, but by far not the only one. And uh, we have also other very important costs, such as bromine uh, removal, if that is a problem. Uh, nanofiltration plant cost is very substantial, and uh, this is the result. We have uh, power consumption that is lower with pure salt. We have hydrochloric acid differential that is substantial. Membrane life differential is, uh, is, is not so significant. Plant depreciation differential. And at the end, we have arrived at a comparison uh, showing that the present salt, brine, and other cost of 20, sorry, uh, the, that the present cost, delivered cost of the salt of 27 euro per ton would be, uh, or let's put it this way, that a very pure salt supplied at 46 euro per ton would produce the same cost as the uh, salt that is substantially cheaper. Okay? So this, of course, um, uh, this, of course, uh, is a, a unique uh, case. In every plant, the situation is different. And <coughs> in every case, we have to take a look uh, in detail uh, to see what changes and what uh, prices would be justified. The conclusions. Uh, the ultra-pure salt makes primary brine purification redundant. With ultra-pure salt, the anion removal systems are not required. With uh, ultra-pure salt, the membrane life of up to eight years is possible. With ultra-pure salt, plant operating cost is reduced. Uh, plant extra capacity is not required because of constant uh, current efficiency. Loss of production is avoided. A price can be justified, higher price, substantially higher price, 74%, uh, can be justified, and uh, of course each case has to be examined uh, by itself. Uh, this we have already seen, 
and uh, otherwise I thank you very much for uh, having appreciated our our uh, advertising with the Swiss chocolate. Unfortunately, we have already run out. So uh, those of you who have taken two, please share it with somebody uh, who came too late. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.